Your drive will never run out. You deserve monthly retirement income that does the same. In over 100 years, TIAA has never missed a payment. Guaranteed monthly income for life. Learn more at TIAA.org slash never run out. Annuities issued by Teachers Insurance and Annuity Association of America, New York, New York. Guarantees subject to its claims paying ability. And I think more artists need to remember you're already being ignored. So don't worry about being ignored more. Just make this authentic, horrifyingly spiritual Yelp and you'll get, you know, what you need to get. Welcome. I'm Doug Casina. I'm an artist, a gallerist, a curator, and a collector. And this is Artbound, where we deconstruct the myths and misconceptions of the art world. We have the conversations here with artists that aren't going to be found anywhere else. Welcome to Artbound. In this episode, we're talking about the tipping points that we have as artists, those seemingly pivotal moments that can make or break careers. I have two amazing artists here to talk about it with me. First, in studio, here is Jonathan Size. Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Doug. Um, I also have joining us from his studio in Denver, Colorado, uh, artist Ron Hicks. Hi, Ron. What's up, guys? How y'all doing? Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And before we dive into this topic, which I think is going to be a lot, uh, I want to give our listeners a little bit of background about the two of you and why I think you guys are so wonderful for this topic. Jonathan Size is a magician. That's kind of the only way I can think to describe him. He is a little bit of a guerrilla renegade artist who does performative works. He does murals. Um, He does a lot of mixed media uh, approaches to his artwork. Uh, Most notably recently, I had the pleasure of working with him on a show that was a solo at the Denver Art Museum, where he had 10,000 small, intimate little paintings that created this column that was 10 feet in diameter by eight feet high that was called What is Utopia, where we ended up giving away all 10,000 of these little individual paintings. Um, It was quite a spectacular show. And Ron Hicks is a really interesting painter in the fact that he's had this really transformative journey as an artist. Ron comes from a very traditional background of figure painting primarily and has more recently evolved his work into the contemporary vernacular. Um, It's been a real privilege to watch this evolution in his work and kind of his expansion of it. He speaks that vernacular of both the kind of traditional representational approach and also, uh, you know, the contemporary abstract, more kind of intimate psychological portraiture that are now part of his newest body of work. He's represented by galleries all over the world. He's had many museum and public exhibitions, and he's just one of my favorite people on the planet. So the tipping point. This is a really interesting question for me because I personally don't look at being an artist as a career path or as a job. Uh, For me, it's a lifestyle choice. And it's something that at a certain point in my life, I think there was a little bit of a conscious decision towards making that. I think it was also subconscious. But as I've grown as an artist, as I've grown in this field as a gallerist and as a curator, it's absolutely something that I know is embedded into my being, into the way that I show up into the world. Is this something that you can connect with, Jonathan, this idea of there was some point in your life where you consciously made some decision that this is what you're doing? Well, I think there's there was no aha moment. I think there was a progression where eventually the weight of doing it wrong added up to a... Uh, a realization that I could do it a different way. So maybe that was five years ago or so after 15 years of doing it full time, sort of doing it the traditional way with gallery representation in in different countries and, and different bodies of work, where suddenly I felt 
like I was just mimicking or mirroring something that I had seen in the past as opposed to making my own version. And that, that transformation happened kind of slowly until suddenly I didn't recognize why I was doing it anymore. You said you were doing it wrong. I was doing it wrong. I just was doing it to survive. And I was kind of emulating a slightly outdated model for myself. What was your experience getting into the idea of being a full-time artist, Ron? I started at an early age myself, and uh, my mother was an artist of sorts. She didn't kind of take it to the extent of you know, where I am at this point. But, uh, you know, she always had like these art books around, and she took this correspondence course. It was, uh, I forgot what the actual school was called, but, you know, they would have ads placed everywhere, like back in the day. And I know I'm dating myself. Oh, this is the one where you draw the turtle. <laughs> yes, exactly. It was Tippy the turtle. <laughs> you too can be a famous artist. So I always knew that I was going to be, well, actually, one of two things. Um, and I, I tell this from time to time, it, I, it was either this or tire changing because I was into cars. Uh, so <laughs> so I'm glad that I sort of, uh, I hate changing tires. I was going to say, do you still change your tires? Not, not at all. Uh, I'm not good at it. Um, uh, my path getting, you know, working as a full-time artist sort of, it was by, by osmosis. So I had a number of people along the way, teachers, things of that nature that kind of said, hey, this guy's got something, pushed me in the, the right direction in college, you know, got a scholarship. So I sort of moved along until I got to the graduation side of it. And then reality sunk in. And I I had a choice to make. And there is this, well, do I, you know, follow this path? And, and you'll hear people, you know, saying, well, no, you can't make a, a you know, a living as an artist, you know, there's the starving artist thing. So that was in my head. So I, I started to push my uh, uh, studies towards more like graphic design and things, of, and things of that nature, because I thought, you know, that was the, the thing to do. And when I quickly got out of school, I figured I found out that I just didn't like doing that kind of work. Well, you were saying there was a choice there. What was the choice? Was it between making money and not making money? Is that what you saw that as? Well, yeah. So, so because you have all these voices in your head, you know, when you're young, you're kind of like taking things as they come. And so when I was hearing all these things about, well, that passion that you have, you know, to be an artist and to be true to who you are, you know, that may not work. You know, what are you going to do? You have to make a living. You know? uh, so it wasn't like, well, for me, it wasn't like, well, you know, I'm just going to do this anyway and, and just see what happens. You know, I really started to think, well, gosh, you know, if, uh, you know, being a full-time artist and not just working for a uh, graphics company or something like that, you know, what am I going to do? So uh, what I chose to do was push my, uh, my studies towards graphic design. And then when I graduated, I worked a couple jobs, realized I hated it because coming out, you know, you have all these fantasies of becoming like an art director or something like that. And, and back in the day, and I don't know if it's like this now, but someone would have to die uh, for you to move up the ladder, you know, so I was like, at, you know, I was working for a couple of magazines, you know, stripping negatives, you know, doing the classified section. And that was back when it was all wax and paste stuff. And, and I just didn't like it. And I dealt with a bunch of like sales rep that sales reps that were just like, Hey, look, you need to work on my project. You know, it was, it was sort of chaotic for me. Were you doing art on the side at that point, Ron? Were you still having some kind of, uh, practice as far as an artist how how did that really kind of inform what you were doing as an artist at that time well the odd thing is um i would work as much as i could but because i started you know working for a couple of agencies there wasn't a whole lot of time you know it was just like you worked from sun up to sundown basically because you had a lot of i had a lot of a, a huge workload and sometimes after that it was just like i am not going to do this when i come home i'm just going to prepare for the next day so what it did for me is it took me away from my painting and that's when i decided you know i can't do this anymore and and i left the the companies and i went into more of the freelance art uh, side of it because i thought it was a happy segue in between the commercial side and uh and, and actual painting that that and, sounds uh, and so that that was my crossroads sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you i just uh that sounds super familiar for all artists to reach that point where we realize we're kind of unemployable in other areas where we don't have complete control 
So that sounded very familiar for me too. this like hustling pattern where you, you try and fill the gaps everywhere you can until you realize it's it's just not going to work. And until you realize that you don't have like a studio practice anymore. Well, yeah. And that was the worst. And, and you could probably uh, attest to this, you know, being an artist that <laughs> when you start to move away from, you know, what you're, you think that you're born to do, and then you're doing something that really starts to appear like work and something that you really don't want to do. It's kind of like, ugh, you know, you almost dread coming in to do it. Is art still work for you though, Ron? I mean, like, do you look at your art practice nowadays as kind of work for you? You know, there's got to be times where you struggle to get through a project or that you have deadlines or other things like that. How, how does that differ in your mind? Is it because you had that kind of energetic shift where you're like, oh, my God, this is this is what I'm supposed to be doing? Well, I, I would say it's work and then it's not work. You know, as you start to, sh you know, well, in my case, showing galleries, you know, and then you have like these obligations to like shows and things of that nature. It's, it's sort of, huh, I want to say, I have to say it carefully because it's sort of like anti-inspirational because when you start to add like a barrier or a deadline that, that puts, you know, a limit on your creativity. I would love to just say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to work on this piece. I started it. I'm going to see it to the finish. And that's sort of the space I'm working in right now. I work <clears throat> when I'm supposed to be working. In those early days, it was more like, hey, you know what? I agreed to do a couple shows this year, so I have to have work for it. And it, I don't think that I would say I was not in a very creative way of thinking, but sometimes I'll have a, a piece in my studio that sits for like six months or so, you know, and every now and then I'll go and work on that piece. And that's, a, for me, a, a, a better way of working than saying, hey, you know what? This piece has to leave my studio in 30 days. What am I going to do with it? Sometimes that pressure is good and works, and sometimes it does. Well, Jonathan, when you started finding your voice as an artist, I know that uh, you had told me a little bit about your, you know, your background as far as getting that, you know, formal training through art school. Could you kind of walk me through what that transition was, why you went to art school, and what happened through that? Sure. Uh, it makes me laugh already because you know where the story ends up. Basically you know, at, at 16, 17, 18, where the, the dream starts to materialize and, you know, the next step is to go to a university and study. So I, I kept doing that and I would drop out after a few months. Uh, this was a, a painting school in Paris. And then I came back and then went to another school in New York and dropped out and went to another school in Baltimore and dropped out. And that's kind of a huge piece of advice I have for artists who are looking for finding themselves is to immediately drop out and just uh, do it, save the money, save the time, and also stop stop listening to people. I can't, I can't hear my own voice when I'm listening to other people's voices, which is a funny thing to say on radio. Um, <laughs> where there's all these, yeah. <laughs> so, so it was really important for me to start the process so that I know I, I knew that I was capable and feel confident, but then it was more important for me to leave it and to kind of make it up on my own, which, which made certain things harder too. I, I couldn't fall back onto a teaching job, which a lot of my artists friends do. And I don't think there's anything wrong with teaching, but I do think it keeps you out of the studio, which is a problem if you want to really build your, your voice. And then the other thing is curriculums tend to be outdated and very expensive and cliques form, you know, everyone, everyone in grad school knows each other and they show at the same galleries and they do similar work and then they try and be different from each other. But in this, it's, it's a, a herd mentality that I was very allergic to. So I have very few friends because of it, but I think I have a, an ability to kind of dive into my own personal voice more, more deeply. So I hate college. That was my whole point. <laughs> I I concur. <laughs> wow. So it's like across um, the board drop out of college. Just drop right out now. right That's, now. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll say this because I recently had the opportunity uh, to work with a, a good friend of mine. His daughter was going to a, a school. And I, I remember going to like one of the graduation <laughs> And I was talking to a lot of the instructors that are, and, and, and this is not a knock because I know there are some good schools with good instructors and things of that nature, because I think that that, I had a number of instructors that were very instrumental in sort of, 
you know, at least piquing my interest, but not controlling what I was doing, you know, and I think that's important as well. Uh, when you get to that mindset of, you know, hey, you must do it like this, which uh, there are a lot of curriculums that are like, if you don't do it like this, then you fail. Uh, that's when I think we get into trouble. So at any rate, getting back to this, this story, you know, I went to this graduation and they, talking to a number of the instructors and then and talked to, you know, the student and friend's daughter and she was sort of floating around like, like, hey, just do what you want. And in a sense, that's good. But it seemed like there was a lot of money for someone to say, hey, just do what you want. <laughs> you know, you could just do what you want. Exactly. So. You know, for me with my undergraduate education, I feel like I got a lot out of it, not necessarily how to paint, but I think it was more important for me about like how to learn and how to explore and that curiosity and other things that I think I got a lot more from at, uh, you know, kind of the, the university level, you know, they don't really teach you technique. And I, I know this is a topic for a whole nother podcast is that idea of the atelier versus kind of the MFA, uh, you know, approach to art. And what do you get from those two different things? You know, is it about concept or is it about execution? You know, and I, I feel like there's a lot of those kind of springboard points based on what kind of art education you're starting with and, you know, what kind of decisions you make as far as where your career heads from those initial decisions about how you learn how to approach art. Did you guys, ha either of you have any role models that were artists growing up? Like, was there somebody in your family? I know, Ron, you said that your mom... Uh, worked within the arts. Where, did you guys know any professional artists? No, uh, I did. As a matter of fact, when I when I decided to to uh, leave Columbus, Ohio, I, I had a uh, a full scholarship there. I came back back to Colorado, and there was one instructor there. His his name was Rennie Bruin, and he was to me like uh, this amazing person because talking to him, he is the single most person and this is you know out of both schools that had just this way of seeing art that was different than just hey you know draw this cast and you have to make it look exactly like that it was more of a, a conceptual thing you know where he picked out specific uh, like visual elements or ideas and then you know we were exploring those ideas and from that that was my jumping point uh, into the way that I, i've been thinking to this to this very point now, I do believe that you could put yourself into any box and it could be a situation that doesn't work for you. Because if you, you know, go to any camp and you, I guess you could say if you make it something that's like overkill where you follow it to the letter because it's something you think you should be doing, then that, that gets you off your game, in my opinion. I think you should take things in, absorb them, experience them for yourself, and then formulate your own way of figuring out how that information works in your work. Would you say that was kind of like your experience or, 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 or no? Jonathan? Well, and that's kind of where I started. And I, I'm finding a theme emerging, which is basically you have to do a lot of things wrong for a long enough period of time to f see the patterns. And once you can see the patterns, you can choose something different. Uh, so I had people that I emulated. And I was thinking I was if I was going to offend anyone that I knew who was a professional artist. And the closest was my grandmother who painted really ugly tree paintings but I loved it always was really inspiring to to hang out with her while she painted um and what's cool too is when when she died I found this big box full of old oil paints from the 70s that were still good so I still work with those in my studio so her energy nice is more inspiring in some ways of just sort of enjoying it and having fun as opposed to like a professional you know I find professionals to be pretty boring uh, in a lot of ways in all careers so even even being a professional artist I, it starts to become more like a hedge fund manager or a i don't know a, a car salesman or something that, that that who we're emulating is different than the spiritual magicians to use doug's doug's word or, or wizards that we are that's a that's a long way to answer a question in a really weird way but no there was no one i really took advice from because I, I know it didn't seem to be working for anyone else either. And mm -hmm. and that's kind of also what I feel is it doesn't work to do it the same way. Well, absolutely. I feel like I know artists who went to the same grad schools, went to the same residency programs and are at two completely different places in their careers. I, I There's no path in this 
<laughs> journey as an artist that gets you in uh you know they're all tangential they're there is no right path to this. It's what's right for you as an individual. So when, Jonathan, did you kind of say, okay, I'm I'm 100% in as this artist. There's nothing else for me to do. Like, was it, it sounded like you were already there pr- before you kind of even went to art school. When I, after dropping out the third time, and uh, I got a job at a coffee shop just to make some money to travel and I realized that was not enough money. So my, my my journey starts kind of commercially where then I would set aside three or four months and make my own series of, of works and then host sort of a one night liquidation art garage sale. And after doing that time after time, I built a group of people who were sort of following my work and I, I learned how to do that part of it better. So that I was around 21, 22. And then that's when the formal doors started opening with other galleries but i but i would flash forward to you know my mid 30s when when ev- when that whole system just kind of got stale and repetitive that's when something happened for me pretty clearly and i i keep trying to find the answer to your question it was do i want to spend the rest of my life doing this pattern or do i want to redefine the pattern and that's when the the museum show came even out of nowhere because I came up with the idea and I presented it to multiple museums. I sort of took the initiative. And that was the first time I felt like a real professional where I was making my own concept and I was pitching it around and I had proof of concept from the past where I could show I'm capable of doing this, this, and this. And it added up to more than just a pattern. Does that, did that make sense? You know, it was like a, the doing the pattern, learning how to be proficient in it, getting bored with it, and then picking all of the best parts from that pattern to make a new version for myself. And then I started working with you, Doug, who understands that I like to do it that way. Well, it sounds like you got to a point in your career where you said, I have to take control of this. Exactly. And, and I think I think that's important to remind maybe younger artists to that we are we are the innovators the systems and the ideas that we come up with should shape the industry we shouldn't be shaping ourselves to fit in a pre-existing industry and as soon as you do that you glow brighter your work has more dynamic magnetism and people see that and they offer you the opportunities that you were trying to earn doing it the right way. That's kind of what I mean by doing it the wrong way versus the right way. Well, you know, and that kind of brings over this bigger theme of why we do art. You know, I think at some point or another, we're trying to make a contribution to this world. For me, and I think we kind of alluded to it as this magic, I look at art as almost the purest form of magic. You know, we're as creators uh, making an object and the whole reason why that object exists is to be imbued with some magic that we put in it. And then when somebody approaches that, they're able to resonate with it and it might change their life or it might change our culture or it might change the world. So the only reason why that object exists is to have a conversation with somebody else. There's no real tangible thing and the end result is change. Uh, And in my mind, that's the definition of what magic is. So I think that if you kind of look at, hey, this whole career of being an artist, this, you know, if you look at really what it boils down to is you're here to help change the dialogue of of our culture, that kind of shapes how you take a path because it, it takes out the ideas of money. It takes out the ideas of the right way or the wrong way for you as an individual, and it helps you kind of uh, take that direction. Support for this podcast comes from Snuggle Super Care. How do you keep clothes looking great? You could hand wash them, lay them flat to dry, and wear them every other leap day. Or try new Snuggle Super Care. It keeps clothes looking newer for longer, better than the leading value detergent alone. Fight color fade with new Snuggle Super Care fabric conditioner. 
for for me, I know I had a tipping point when I was in college. I was originally going to school for molecular cellular developmental biology. You know, I had, I had been working on the side as an artist. I had first been published as an artist when I was, you know, a kid, an 11 year old. And uh, I knew that art was something that was in my soul, but I had bought into the, I needed to have a career. I needed to do something to make a living. I knew that, you know, that was a hard path because I'd been told that from everybody in my life. And so at some point or another, I, you know, going into the kind of medical profession and the idea of genetics, I looked at that as, boy, I can change the way somebody feels, but art can change the way somebody thinks and the way that they show up in the world, because that's what happened for me in my life. Art changed that dialogue for me. And I thought that it was much more important for me to show up that way. Like that seemed like a greater good for me in some way or another. And that's when I ended up doing two degrees in the fine arts. And I remember that very much as, you know, it, it seemed a little esoteric at time and a little grandiose, but I, I really see that as like, that was that moment where I said, this is what I have to do. Well, giving yourself permission to feel grandiose is a hard spot to get to as an artist. Cause it feels like uh, you have to be practical for so long that suddenly, yeah, you don't, you don't give yourself permission to dream big, but when you do that, something does shift. Right. Like how could your art change the world? But I'm sitting here talking with two people whose art has changed their community, has changed the world, has been on that platform. And, and that's why I resist the idea of this idea of a, a professional artist, because I, I truly think that you're an artist or you're not, even if you paint, because not every painter is an artist. Uh, and, and some of the things that you're speaking of, Doug, reminds me of what I would define as someone being an artist, where it's, you know, it's not about how many paintings you're selling or how well your technique is, but it's really about who you are and what you're putting out to, it, to the world. I think that because we are artists or a lot of the people that I know, um, you could give them a stick and some bubble gum and they can be creative with that. Whereas some of your professional artists per se might, you know, look at that and go, well, you know, that doesn't fall within the, you know, what I learned is technique. So therefore it doesn't work. So do you have some I think, examples of people you'd like to share with us, Rob? <laughs> well, I'm going to put yeah. that close to my vest right now. Well, I was, when you talk about bubble gum, I think that the tipping point, the grand tipping point should also be us moving away from the physicality of art and more towards the like energetic intentionality. And I think that that's where a lot of artists get really stopped up and like, why don't I feel like an artist or why do I not have the confidence to call myself an artist or what my personal tipping point is because they've programmed themselves to operate like car manufacturers or, or factories. We've been taught, I think capitalism and consumerism sort of feeds the artist's identity where making products, making them good, making them quick, making them desirable, making them valuable becomes what a career is supposed to look like. But that's not what being an artist is. So my point, yeah. and, and I completely agree with what you're saying, but who tells us that? You know, where does that mindset come from? That's the thing that I think that in order to like, you know, going further, if we don't have these exterior things that are, you know, put on, I call them layers that are put on top of us, then maybe we would be more you know, proficient at being artists as opposed to uh, some of the things that you just mentioned. We, we fall into those roles because it, not everyone, uh, and, and you sound like a person that has never let that be something that dictates what you do, but there, there are a number of artists that are coming, you know, out and they're getting into art school for some of those very reasons. And they have never been introduced to another way of thinking. They, it becomes a part of their DNA. So when you have those challenges, that come up that we've all faced with those. What are some of the strategies that you guys have used to like actually work through that? You know, those exact same things that you were bringing up that, you know, when you're struggling with your identity as an artist, when you're looking at this model that's maybe outdated for you or that doesn't ring authentic for the way that you practice, what are some of the things that have helped you push through that helped you keep going in those moments? Well, I can tell you for me, my path, which is why I'm, in the current state I am in now is because 
that artistic inner voice <laughs> is sort of um, battling with some of these things. And for me, I have no choice but to listen to it. In what ways are you battling with it, Ron? There are some things that I'm doing now that I probably wouldn't have done 10 or 15 years ago just because I thought, oh, no, who wants to hear that? You know, because I was, I, I would say I would be painting more for the masses instead of painting for what truly was inside my heart. Uh, and, you know, maybe there's no monetary gain that comes of it, but I have to do it. Was there something that just came up for you recently that like, it sounds like this is something that was a, a real recent conversation that you've had that you're giving yourself permission to explore something with. What was the impetus that where you said, okay, that's enough. I started coming to this conclusion that uh, I don't want to live with any regrets and you, you get one life. And if you, if I get to the very end and I go, shucks, I should have followed that. Or I should have tried that. I should have done that. It's too late at that point. So I would start to do these paintings in my studio that would give me more of this sense of freedom and, and joy. And then I found myself moving and being drawn to more of those and then going, oh, shoot, I got to get over here and do this work. And it wasn't until someone came into the studio, one of the uh, gallery directors and goes, hey, what's going on over there? And I was like, oh, well, it's just some stuff I'm working on. And they're like, oh, my, do you mind if I take some of this? And I'm like, well, sure, why not? And, and it became a lot more personal for me. And, and a lot of it wasn't just solely based on, you know, me trying to paint for the masses, but really dealing with my own self. Uh, and that comes out in some of the work too, with the way that I apply paint, you know, what I do with the paint, the shapes and relationship. Can you identify with that, Jonathan? I think I was lucky or just um, in a weird mindset, maybe five or six years ago where I really convinced myself that I was an alien and that has really helped me in this process. And what I mean by that is if I was an alien, if I was not a human, I didn't know any of the, the, the ways that the world works, how would I approach this situation? And by doing that, I was able to sort of, every time I felt inauthentic, every time I felt that I was following a model that wasn't my own spiritually, I would just ask the alien, um, I sound like a, like I'm insane, but I would ask the alien, like, what would, what would you do? And the alien always came up with a really funny, ridiculous, uh, very liberated way. And I would do it that way. And that funnily enough, that would actually release the pressure within me that I was being inauthentic and it would open other doors. And on the flip side of that coin, I think a lot of artists struggle with this fear of being irrelevant or being invisible, uh, being overlooked, all of that. And eventually I told myself, Jonathan, you are invisible. You are overlooked. You will die in obscurity. And that's good. That's beautiful. That's liberating. So don't, don't live under the fear that you're not going to be you know, that someone's not going to notice you just do everything wrong in the way that you feel is right. And it doesn't really matter. So a good example is Instagram. You know, I will send random messages to curators uh, with an idea for a show. And I know that's not, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to do it the right way. Your, your gallery dealer connects or some co collector who, but my thought is they already don't know who I am. And if they ignore me, it's not going to change my reality, but there's an off chance that they might not ignore me. So in the past few years, it's just been identifying where I felt constricted by convention and then um, doing the opposite. Well, and I love that you brought up that there's supposedly a right way. See, like you've still even bought into that idea that, oh, the only way to get a museum show or work with these curators is through X, Y, Z, which again, sure, that's worked. And that's part of the path that some people took. But as you said earlier, you had this amazing solo museum show at a huge institution through you know, an through an Instagram message, through, through by an, the way, it was right? it was a here's an idea. I'm passionate about it. It kind of breaks some of the rules that I believe to be there. Are you interested? That's awesome. Yeah, and and I think more artists need to remember you're already being ignored. So don't worry about being ignored more. Just make this authentic, horrifyingly spiritual Yelp, and you'll get you know what you need to get. 
Well, and this is this is the point where like I give out the phone number for our producers here so that I don't get a flood of emails <laughs> saying why did you tell everybody to like haunt me on Instagram, <laughs> you know, from all the guidance counselors who, you know, we just told people to drop out of school, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, live your truth. That's right. Yeah. That better right. Way. No, you're, you're totally <laughs> right. And that's yeah. the whole thing with an artist is the truth is really coming from authenticity. And, you know, that's a, I, I, one thing that I'm really picking up as another theme on top of this is it really comes from this idea of being self-aware. You know, it sounds like, Ron, you had a moment of self-awareness where you said, okay, this is the way that I've been working, and now I'm working in a different point. Has that changed the way that you feel about your paintings and the way that your studio practice has changed? Not really at all. And a lot of people will look at the, the this newer body of work and go, oh my God, you've completely <laughs> flipped your script, but you know, this has been with me forever. It just has been covered up or I haven't really shown a lot of it. So a lot of the things that I'm dealing with in my work has always been. So for me, it's not as big of a surprise or, or a stretch as, as, it, as it might uh, be to you know someone that doesn't live inside my world. So my studio practices are pretty much the same. But I will say this, I've given myself more permission if you... Uh, want to add a change to explore more with how I apply paint, you know, the energy and, uh, and why I'm, I'm doing it. Um, there are less tangible things in my, uh, my work. Like I used to paint a lot of cafe scenes and people interacting with one another. And now um, it's really more about some of the, you know, visual elements like shape, edges, textures, you know, you know that sort of thing is more important to me than, uh, than anything else. So. So, Jonathan, when did it occur to you that you were an artist? I feel like we've been talking about a lot of how this comes from this self-awareness. Do you remember that first time that you said it's like, I'm an artist? And, and what did that mean to you? It, it was an early act of rebellion, I think at age 17, when, uh, I, when I felt brave enough to, to sort of proclaim it and then start the path forward. But it didn't really feel real until I actually learned what being an artist is, uh, which is not what I thought it was initially. What is being an artist? I think it's um, this uncompromising empowerment, self-empowerment uh, towards expressing something that you can't quite Put your finger on it's it's not about making paintings or sculptures um it's about giving an outlet for the unspoken feelings for everyone else uh and also saying the things that are uncomfortable to say with what you're doing so being an artist is really being an activist for social issues just using creative wonderful dynamic colorful uh, mediums so I, I think that i think once i accepted that it made it easier for me to embrace what I felt being an artist was. So yeah, a visual activist, actually. Hmm. Well, and Ron, you made a really kind of definition that there are people who paint that aren't artists. Um, and that, that there are artists, obviously, then who don't paint as well. What is, for you, what's the definition of being an artist? And when did you start kind of self-identifying as an artist? Uh, maybe I could answer the last first. I think it's an ever evolving sort of thing for me. So I would say what it means to me to be an artist is really one that's a, it is is total honesty with and and total truth. And I'm striving to get towards you know to move to you know in that direction. As I did say, there there are a lot of people who paint, and and I've run across a few of them. You know, in in some of my teaching and things of that nature, where it's always this really uh, linear way of thinking. It's like that A plus B has to equal C. And if it doesn't do that, then, then it's either right or it's wrong. And I think that, you know, a true artist transcends all of that. And as I mentioned a little bit earlier, I believe that a true artist is creative regardless of what the medium is or what the source, you know, you are an artist because you are an artist. And, and I believe that true artists have been put down here as Jonathan mentioned, to do something greater than just make pretty paintings or make art that's just pleasing to you know people's eyesight. There, it's deeper than that. 
So I, I can't give you like a, you know, an exact definition of what that looks like, but I know that earlier in my career, what I thought was true art. And at that point, you know, when I graduated high school, I thought that, you know, gosh, if you could draw something the exactly the way it looked, you know, transfer that information from one spot and put it in another, that made you an artist. But that is way far from the truth for me now. Um, that has really nothing to do with it. Just like your artwork, your definition of what an artist is constantly evolving. I think that's true for all of us who've embarked on this journey of of exploration in a way. Do you, like, this is just as far as semantics go, like, do you guys introduce yourselves as artists? When you, when somebody comes up to you, you're <laughs> when, like, I'm when, an artist. Well, one, one yeah. time, <laughs> yeah. One time I, inter- I introduced myself as a painter and someone was like, I got these three rooms. <laughs> I would love for you. And I was like, wait a minute, maybe I should introduce myself as an artist. <laughs> yeah, it depends uh, on the context, not not at Starbucks or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny when, when um, my wife, she said, she'll go, yeah, my, my, my husband is an artist. And the, the first thing I go, well, wait a minute, it's, does he play music? And then the second thing is, oh, you poor soul, <laughs> <laughs> you know, does he, <laughs> can you make him, you know, living at, so they go through all these stereotypes and, and some of them are true because I, I know there are some artists that can be extra special, you know, as, as, as life has moved along, you know, my wife has been uh, the most amazing person. You know, I say, you put up with me, you have, that's a lot, not that I'm a, a huge handful, but you know, this life is, uh, at least for me, is like we're, we're stuck in a studio. And, you know, for the most part, we're, it's, we're, we're by ourselves. Or, or we're stuck in our heads, sort oh. of, you know, trying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering, you know, to kind of leave on, if you had a piece of advice for somebody who's kind of debating, you know, their identity as an artist, what would you tell them? It's been a reoccurring thing for some of the theme for some of the things that I, I've responded to as we've had these this chat is just, you know, you have to be yourself and live your truth. And if you are expressing yourself as an artist, let that be the catalyst for whatever it is that you do, because anything other than that is a a pretentious way of, uh, of approaching the, your artwork. I totally agree. Uh, Especially the idea that art is this catalyst and you are the catalyst for art. It's a, it's a wonderful way of living. And Jonathan, Um, my advice which is funny to say in front of you because you and I have a professional relationship, but is to to tell artists to stop being, to stop pretending to be professionals. I think that there is something more shamanistic and visceral and unpredictable and energetic than just being a good business person. And I think for a long time, we've been taught that being a professional artist means being a good business person. And that's not true for me. So it would be stop pretending to be a professional. Uh, stop waiting for somebody to give you an opportunity. You have to actually give somebody the idea for your opportunities. People aren't spending their time thinking, dreaming up how they can build your career, or your voice. You have to do that. And three, pretend you're an alien. And like ev- all the other uh, questions sort of fall into place when you just pretend you don't know the right way to do things and you do them authentically. As a dealer <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what? and an artist and yeah. a collector, I absolutely agree with you on a couple of those things. I, I do agree. Let us do the professional side. Correct. Uh, let, let me worry about the business side and let me translate that to you as an artist. Um, yeah, I'm not saying to be unprofessional. <laughs> I'm just saying don't don't make that your, your, yeah, yeah. your no, standard. I, I, I absolutely agree with that and 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 i am so excited that you guys uh you know were here to have this conversation with me today and thank you so much for uh for your vulnerability and for being so authentic with this and uh and uh you heard it here first drop out of school and be an alien i must start try it yeah try it yeah Art Bound is an artist network podcast and produced by Golden Peak Media. It's hosted by me, Doug Casina. Our producer is Daisha Clay with audio engineering by Evan Rutherford. Director of podcasts is Jared Mayer. Executive producer for Artist Network is Scott Meyer. 
Trisha Waddell is the director of content. Sarah Van Patter handles all our marketing. And Vanessa Childers does all things digital. If you'd like more information on sponsoring or advertising on Artbound, go to goldenpeakmedia.com. I'm Doug Casina. Until next time.